Hello everybody. Today we're going to talk about uh, the results from yesterday and uh, yesterday evening I decided to go ahead and cast some silver and I was able to successfully make uh, some rods and these will be turned into links today. Um, it's quite, I found it quite difficult to pour with uh, the temperature of the mold. I didn't have my other, I usually have a secondary torch all set up and heat the mold. And when I was trying to pour in some of these smaller grooves, it was literally um, cooling and plugging up. So I was only able to get these little little stubby bars out of the smaller channels, um, which is okay. I can work with the bigger bars, the thicker bars out of the bigger ones that I was able to get uh, without, without the mold cooling the metal too fast. Um, so I should be able to generate some links today, and I'm going to make some videos of that process, but uh, this is uh, going to be fun. I'm excited. I'm excited to get more of the chain done. Right now we are sitting at with approximately that many links, um, so go for a 20-inch chain overall with this for the gift, but uh, here we go. All right, here's a little closer look at these. Um, rods i was able to get poured with the mold yesterday and this is what we'll be stretching into uh into links um thin wire using the rolling mill this is a ve vor chinese rolling mill um, if you're trying to do really precise stuff this won't work but for what i'm doing it works just fine uh, if you want a really precise like sheet um, what i mean by precise is this has a lot of flex between the the rods so you get a gradient um, of pressure it doesn't roll a perfectly flat um, sheet but it will do um, square wire um, pretty well and also uh, comfort bands pretty well um, anyways we're gonna move forward and I'm gonna make some videos of this happening um, I'm trying to increase my YouTube channel so if you like what you're seeing please like and subscribe and watch me uh, hopefully grow along the journey. I know my channel's been up for quite a few years, but I've never actually taken it real serious and trying to make good quality videos. So here we go. Okay, these are the little bars from the casting. And uh, you gotta take your little nips here. Um, these are flesh cut nips, and I'm cutting off any of the sprues from the casting or the tails, however you wanna call it. But um, anything that's not of proper mass and size, you don't wanna fight the rolling process, I meaning you don't wanna feed through irregular size castings. Um, it's just easier to throw it back in the crucible and uh, cast another bar than try to roll uh, a sprue. After you cut those sprues off, you always uh, want to round them up and throw them back in your crucible to be melted again. And uh, I will end up melting one or two more large bars to complete this necklace before it's all said and done. Here I'm marking the ends with the Sharpie. Um, that way I don't lose direction. Once you start feeding these wires through the mill, you don't want to change the direction of what you feed. It'll cause them to break. Um, literally the, the, the silver will separate if you roll it the wrong way. I'm also um, sending it through, I'm keying it. Um, I'm, it's a square rolling mill, so when you feed the wire through, I'm sending it through and then I'm turning it 90 degrees and then sending it through again. And that's because the that Chinese rolling mill is not true. And if you want to maintain a, a square link, throughout your process or a square square wire um, you've got to do that with this VEVOR. If you had a nice um, uh, rolling mill, one of the really high-end ones, you know, $1,500 rolling mill, you wouldn't have, uh, have to do that. You wouldn't have to turn it 90 degrees. So that's one of the downsides of having a cheaper tool, but 
This thing's I think like $200 on Amazon, so it's way cheaper than a high-end rolling mill. And to be honest, I'm not a professional jeweler by any measure. I'm just a garage jeweler, so why would I ever spend $1,500 on a rolling mill when all I have to do is turn it 90 degrees? And you can buy sheet silver, so if you need sheet silver that's precise, you can buy it and not have to worry about rolling it out perfectly anyhow. So this serves my needs just fine. So as you're sending them through, you can get about two 360 degree turns out of the mill before you have to re-anneal them. And uh, this is the annealing process here. You literally take the torch and heat them up to uh, almost melt. Um, well, not almost melt, but you get them really hot. There's a trick to annealing. You can take a Sharpie marker and mark on it, and once the torch makes the Sharpie disappear, then that's pretty much hot enough for you to uh, consider it annealed. Once you anneal, you always uh, quench, um, and I quench in a pickle solution. You, you can quench in water if you want. It doesn't really matter, uh, especially when working with pure silver. It doesn't oxidize per se, and the pickling solution is what you use to lift the oxidation off. Uh, but literally, that's what you do. You pickle, um, so i.e. quench, and then you go back to the mill. You're able to get two more cycles of 360 out of the adjustment there at top, which is... Um, gives it quite a bit of, bit of stretch as you see here those little little uh, bars are turning into quite long wire at this point now that I've got the bars to the one and a half millimeters I literally take them and straighten them by finger this helps whenever you go to wrap them around whatever device you're going to use to make your coils in my case I use a punch um, but you want to keep your coils because it's a square wire, you want to keep them directional. You don't want it to twist, and that way your coils all match whenever you cut your coil um, pack into individual jump rings. Uh, so you're just looking for uniformity, and that's what I'm doing here. Now that you got your wire straight and flat, you go to wrap them around and make your coils, and that's what's going on right now. I'm uh, using a punch, and I'm wrapping them by hand with uh, assistance of the wood block. Uh, the wood block allows me to grab the silver and keep it wound real tight, and then I'm using the hammer to help compress the, the coil. That it's sometimes they get kind of twisted as you're winding them that's what you're trying to avoid by by pushing them flat with your finger in the previous section uh, and when you do that you, you got to take the hammer or something to get them to seat proper and that's what I was doing was just trying to get them to seat good and make them uniformed um, and that's what I the overall goal is to get as many coils to look identical as possible so all your jump rings when you go to saw them will look identical. So now comes the sawing of the coil. It's very difficult to keep the coil in the ball vise. They make a tool 
that helps hold the little um, coil pack as you can saw it. You can also saw it with a jeweler's um, Fordham tool, which I do have, but you remove a lot of metal with the size of the wheel, the cutoff wheel, versus using a jeweler's saw. You don't lose that much of the overall diameter of the ring. Um, and whenever you close the ring down smaller, you take more metal away, you end up with a smaller overall chain. And I'm just trying to maintain the, the length size that I intended from the get-go. And so I chose or opted to use my jeweler's saw. Way more labor, but uh, in the long run, I save material. Another good tip for uh, sawing silver is you have to use a saw lube. That's what that white uh, stuff is there. You see me um, hitting the saw blade up before I go sawing on the on the links there on the left there. Now that you got your jump rings all uh, cut, you assemble into the chain. Here the chain is not officially soldered. The links are just uh, put together. Um, and later, I don't actually go to solder the chain until I the very last step, I solder all the links in one run. Morning everyone. Thanks for tuning in again. What are we working on today? Well, it's going to be this chain that uh, I started the other day. And we're at 14 inches and I need to be at 20 um, for the gift and that's before the toggle. Last night I came out here before bed and just poured a couple um, bars to get the start on the day. Um, I will pour one, one more of these. That's a big one there. You can see the borax on it as well. So, got that one. Yeah. That little guy right there as well so they're pretty good size considering um, but I'm gonna pour one more today I've got the other half of the silver dollar I told everybody that I like to cut them in half with the bolt cutters down there and um, only melt a half ounce at a time in the crucible it really um, does matter I think makes it easier to manage and pour and it pours a good size rod um, or half ounce does to work with you don't want to get too big of a rod to start feeding through your mill because what happens is you end up with this huge wire that you're trying to feed through that can be a few feet long i kid you not um, this one here this guy will stretch out we're gonna see i'll measure it just so we know the start is without the slack on there without the slack on the tail Oops, it's hard to get that to look. But that's uh, two and a half inches to the, to the little mark there. And uh, we'll see how far it stretches in the end. Here we go. So I oil my mold. Some people use um, the carbon off of the soot, off the torch. But I like to use oil. It seems to really help that silver flow into the mold real fast. Especially a cooler mold if I, you're not using a secondary torch to keep that uh, mold hot. So anyways, I prefer that's just machinist oil and uh, that's what I prefer to use. So now I gotta bust that borax off it. Um, inevitably, I end up with borax on my castings. I always end up using a lot of borax. And it just helps it really flow in, in, the, in the crucible and also transition into the mold really easy. It's not that big a deal to break it off, especially whenever you mill something down from, um, you know, two, in, two and a half inches to what is it here? 
I think it ends at like 22 or 23 inches. So it's a substantial um, lengthening process and compression process that you know. That's why it's important to anneal so much because literally that's a huge transition uh, stretch in the metal. Uh, created a, quite a bit of length. Now it's time to start planning uh, the clasp. Get your pieces and start assembling and get your vision and then uh, move on to making it happen. In the next section we're going to see that happen. Welcome back, day five. Um, part three, I think, is what I'm going to call this. Here we go. Now I'm going to give it a bath in the pickling solution to remove any oils. Pickle's just basically an acid. It eats any oils and cleans it off. Um, that way, whenever I go to do my solders, I'm not fighting, fighting the soldering. Um, I'm going to do a traditional chip solder on the larger jump ring here on the end, the termination ring, um, where the class toggle will hold. I like to chip solder anything large, and then I'll use paste solder on all the smaller links. Makes it a lot easier than trying to use chip solder on them or wire. I feel like I, me personally, I end up burning through the smaller one millimeter uh, and smaller links unless I use paste. And I really like that nano paste from, I think it's a Pepe tool maybe I get it from. But uh, the nano paste actually makes it possible. It seems inevitably when I use the chip solder on the smaller stuff too, I cut too large of a chip and I end up welding the links together instead of the joint. So anyways, uh, yeah, I really like that nano paste. It's pretty cool stuff. So in between each solder, you keep seeing me take the pliers and give it a little squeeze. Um, that's to bring the joint together. You want the joint to actually be touching before you try to solder it. It really does matter. The solder won't work unless they're actually touching. So on this particular chain, I think it turned out to be 85 total solders, total links, but uh, really doesn't matter because it's a gift and I enjoyed doing it. Now it's time to assemble the clasp. Um, I like to assemble my clasp with the ends at a 45. I just really feel like just a traditional bar toggle always falls out, um, especially if it like goes up against something like on a bracelet you put your hand down on a table it'll push the bar right through the toggle um, so I like to put the end terminations on there kind of look like anchor um, ends and then I like to have them kind of at a 45 because I feel like that helps prevent prevent them from falling out or the bar getting pushed through I also like to make the, the bar exactly the size of the termination ring meaning it will pass through just barely um, not too large not too small just right So now that we got the clasp together, it's the cleanup process. It literally is a bunch of filing. Um, whenever you go to make things like this, you gotta have a lot of different files. I have a whole drawer of different files. Um, this particular object is not that difficult, but some things that you make, you gotta really get in tight places. So I just use mostly machinist files uh, for cleaning up really fine machinist work type stuff. They do make jewelry files, but I find the machinist files to be a better value um, and better selection in, in different sizes.
So a neat fact about silver, um, it has the most conductivity of all the transition metals. It is also the most lustrous, meaning it has the most reflectivity. It is an absolute beautiful metal. I feel like once it's alloyed with uh, other metals to create sterling, it loses its shine. It also loses characteristics like a thud. It's really thuddy in its pure state and it becomes more clingy uh, or clanky once you uh, alloy it. So, and that I guess goes with the hardness, right? The harder it is, the, the more clanky it's gonna be and the softer it is, the more thuddy it will be. So the pure silver, of course, is softer than the sterling silver. Uh, another thing about the pure silver versus the sterling silver is pure silver is far less likely to oxidize. It will oxidize in the environment, but at a much lower rate than, you know, an alloyed silver. Um, the nickel that they usually alloy sterling with, it, it definitely oxidizes at a much higher rate, and that's why you uh, have to constantly um, polished sterling silver or 800 silver which would be coin silver um, it, it definitely oxidizes at a really high rate so anyways just a little bit of food for thought So it seems like I'm removing a lot of metal off of these. I, I intentionally leave them large and then I bring them down to size during the cleanup process with the files. As the old saying goes, you can remove material easily, but putting it back, well, let's just say that that's pretty much impossible. Yeah, you can build up a bunch of solder or something like that, but it's not the same as actually having the original metal. And here's the final chain. I think it turned out fantastic and I hope that she really enjoys it. It's been a heck of a project. It took about seven days of work, you know, a few hours per day. I did it old fashioned style, but I, turned, I think it turned out awesome. I sure hope she loves it. <laughs>